thank you again. And uh, I see you have your hand up, so I'll, I'll shut my mouth now. <laughs> I just want to say, I, I want I want everyone to wish Jason a, a happy belated birthday. And I'm, in, at this moment in time, I'm not talking to Jason because he's in Miami and we're in lockdown in England. <laughs> That's true. I can confirm I am. Um, but I want you to know there's some some clouds. They're going to be here for the next <laughs> three minutes, maybe, and then they'll move on. So don't feel don't feel too bad for me. <laughs> OK, thanks, Jay. Thanks. Thanks very much. We do want to turn this over to the floor as quickly as as we possibly can. I've, I've read the book and there's some there's some amusing moments there, Emil, particularly talk us through the barbershop, not name where the barbers was in Liverpool. Oh, man. <laughs> so we, you know, this is this is cultural thing, isn't it? You, one thing you need to know is where the barbers is and you have this is integral to uh, life being in certain areas and I'd moved from Liverpool from Leicester to Liverpool and obviously I write in a book that I struggled a, a lot with it because I'd, I'd moved out of my parents house but I hadn't moved out of my parents house um, I was still around the corner so I was still quite close to that and then I moved to clean to Liverpool and just wasn't a really outgoing person this is before you got your Google Maps and all this that you could just hold in your hand and find out where and your deliver rules and everything so I had to be a bit more outgoing and, and I swear I didn't have a barber for good part of six months <laughs> I was driving back to Leicester to get a, to a haircut to go back to Liverpool and it's literally around the corner from where I was staying as well but I wasn't that sort of outgoing sort of person per, person to be honest but yeah there's some great barbers in Liverpool as well to be fair but what was funny though is in the book when reading it you you could hear your panic yeah <laughs> yeah 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 it was big because <laughs> as well you got you got to remember I was I was 22 when I went to Liverpool 22 so 22 year old going on television without a haircut <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think one of the other things that was that was quite funny is uh, you mentioned 22 there was a great line in the book that you you said Look, I, when I went to Liverpool at 22, I was football mature, but I wasn't. But I was still a kid otherwise. Um, and I think a lot of people find themselves in that position. So you know, there, there you was. You'd gone through the, your pedigree had shown through at all levels of football. So you knew what you were doing in that arena. But mm -hmm. you, you said in other aspects, you were, you, you were still, you were still behind. Still be. um, and I struggled, and I struggled to be honest with you, because again, um, like I said, I, I, I managed to stay under my parents' wings. Um, being in Leicester, when I moved out, you have to grow up very quickly, um, and I struggled with that. And football and being at the training ground was my kind of hideout and hideaway um, because I was around the players, and this is what I'd done from the age of nine, so it was what I knew. And then going back, coming out of that and then going to this, what I thought was, well, which was my apartment at the time, I just didn't know what to do. And yeah, at times you, I'm crying, but it made me grow up very quickly. Oh, yeah. I mean, fantastic, fantastic. Well, Cheatham, have we got, um, have the question started yet? Yeah, we've got a question from Peter. He spent, he sent it to me directly. He's asking, what free, free things do you do every day that have helped you with your success? For example, reading, exercise, et cetera. Well, being part of, uh, of football, exercise was key. So exercise was one. Um, there were certain things that we, that we did and we never really um, knew why we were doing it. So having your own personal space at times. So people call it meditation, but you, you just like to get in a zone and, and zone out and just try and think about certain thoughts and uh, obviously positive ones and, and, and how you're going to play and seeing, watching that game play out. Play out. Um, so that's another one. Um, and eating, eating relatively healthy at the time. I probably could have done better. <laughs> um, I, but the thing is, I came from an era and Jace will say, tell, tell you this as well. I came from an era where eating healthy was the last thing on their mind. It was all football, football, football. We didn't see them little finer margins. It wasn't until I went to Liverpool and then you're, fit, you're taking all these different vitamins, these supplements, these, these, um, and then eating a perfect diet. Uh, that's when that all kicked in. So, um, Emil, you again in the book, you talk about Leicester with such romanticism it was it was fascinating listening to it because even though your part of the city was like a village it sounded like yeah yeah do you think that that beginning really made you who you was 
I think it helped as well. It helped me with the progress of where I was going to because it, 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 we had a community and we knew everyone was backing each other. Um, back then, you, you, you walk down the street. If someone so sees you playing up, that you're getting beat by her and she's going to tell your parents and then you're getting beat by your parents. So everyone knows everyone. Even from a young age, my, my family were well known in Leicester. So I would walk down the street. I'm the spitting image of my dad. I'd walk down the street and everyone would be shouting Hesky. Um, so I got used to that sort of thing, just walking down the street and, and waving to people that I don't really know. So it was just a big, big community every, and, and Caribbean community. Uh, the pub that we all went to on a Sunday um, playing uh, all sorts of music, solar, uh, um, bashment, and I knew everyone up and down that um, the high rise and everything. So that was the comfort. And that, I think that that's obviously what you missed when you first of all went to, to Liverpool. I think so, yeah. That plus being around my parents, because again, like I said, I hadn't really I hadn't really detached myself from them enough to be moving two hundred miles away. Um it could have been it could have been clean across to America. I just it just felt so far away. Um but yeah, having that family orientated um vibe because again, when we moved out of that area, I still had to go into that area to go and see my grandparents every every weekend. I stayed with them every weekend. Cheatham. Yeah, we've got a few questions in the chat. So we've got a question from Jonathan. Who was the most inspirational manager you've played under? I always say two. I always say two. Uh, Martin O'Neill was fantastic for me when I first came through. Um, he gave me the opportunity. It was actually Mark McGoo who gave me my debut. But Martin O'Neill gave me the sustained um, time on the pitch. So he, he started me every week. Um, and he would say, son, you're really good at this. This is what I like to see you do. You do this and you'll be in my team all the time. So I just did it. It wasn't complicated. It was what I was used to doing anyway. He used to say, get the ball, turn and run at players. So that's all I did. And then I moved to Liverpool and then you get a bit more technical about football. And we I literally, we're doing that 45 minutes to an hour session with no ball, just shape, tactical shape. Moving, moving from here to there to there to there. So when you actually go on a pitch, you've already got the visions in your head without the ball. So you're just moving and it's just, it's just effort, effortless. Um, and I'd say uh, Julia was, was fantastic for that. And then he obviously took it to the next level with, um, with your diet and, and things like that. Because I know I've spoken to a lot of other players who really didn't get it at the time. But now they look back and say, I wish I'd have fed it into what he was saying. Since the book's come out, um, Gerard has passed. He passed away, and, yeah. Yeah, and you talk very fondly of him. You, you mention him like a father figure and like a mentor. Mm -hmm. What were, I mean, sometimes, and you'll know this, Emil, people come into your life and you, you bump into them through football, but actually they add more value to your life than just, mm -hmm. just that. Uh, uh, talk to us about the man. Yeah, he was great. Again, anything that you needed, anything that you wanted to talk about, he would talk about with you and sit down with you. Every morning he'd come to you and, and ask you how, you how your kids are doing. How's your wife doing? How's this person doing? How's your mum doing? And he'd name them by name as well. So it was very intimate with you. Um, and then any time I needed to speak to him about anything, I would call him up um, and just and have a chat about coaching or have a chat about this, have a chat about that. And he was open to talking about anything and open to taking my calls at any given time. He, if he didn't, take that call, he would text me and say he's, he's doing something and he will call me back. And he always did. Um, but it's not just for me. When I, when I first met Julie, I was actually playing for England under 18s. Julie was the France under 18s manager and he had Thierry Henry as captain. So Thierry Henry's come out and said, again, another person who, who said he was a, a fantastic mentor for him. He was, the reason that, uh, he was the reason that Thierry Henry got the captaincy. He gave it to him. And, and, and forced him to be the leader that he was. Cheatham? Um, we've got a few questions about how you'd prepare for a game and um, what it felt like in terms of the, the mental preparation. Generally, the games are all the same in the sense of you, you have a t set times where you're doing certain things. Before the game, I, I would, I would, there would be usually music playing in the background, whatever, but I would like to get in my own little, my own little space and have a little bit of a stretch and just zone out a little bit, just getting prepared mentally for the, for the game. Because every game is different, obviously, and... You need to prepare differently for some. Some don't. You don't even need the hype to get up for. So the so the Everton the the Merseyside derby. You don't need hype. That you know it already. So 
really get in the zone to focus on what you want to do. We've also got some questions around the wider support that you you had, um, be that through the game itself and family and friends. Um, what was that support network like for you? And I guess around that, is there anything now, and we know that there's some work that you're doing off the pitch now, is there mm -hmm. some support that you know wasn't there? And, and obviously you're trying to plug that gap now. Can you expand a little bit on that work? So my network was obviously my friends, uh, my um, family and friends. Um, so my parents were there, my, more my friends, to be honest, they would come up and drive up, um, take time to drive up and see how I am, et cetera. And that was kind of it. Is there a support mechanism through football? Back then it was kind of deal with it. Your mat, it was like a, this macho thing, just deal with it. Just get over it. Where's the next one? You, you've, get, you, you've always got a chance of making it better in the next game, in the next training session. Deal with it. So it was very macho back then. And this is probably something that we're, we're looking at now as player for player to try and plug a gap. Uh, and uh, Jason mentioned the, uh, the education side of things where I'm doing the MIP. J Jason's already finished it. And, and a couple of the lads who were on his, his course, uh, are, we've started a company called Player for Player, which is actually trying to help footballers with their, with their, along their journey because it's going to have ups and downs and it's not going, all going to be good. But at least if you're if you're focused, if you're um, if you planned right, it will be okay. Because again, we have so much time within football, and no one talks about education. Then you get to the end, and football kicks you out, and then they tell you, "Oh, well, you're not educated." Well, you told me I couldn't while I was doing it, and then when you come out of it, they tell you, "Well, you've <laughs> got to go and get it." So then you spend another four years getting it. And then it comes to and said, oh, you haven't got the experience. Well, I could, I could have got the experience if you'd given me that four years while I was getting the education. So there's so much that needs to be done within that sense. Um, and this is where player for players looking to plug the gap where we're, we're trying to help these uh, younger lads and even the older ones who are coming out of the game with, um, like I'm, I'm, I'm wanting to do a lot of, because uh, I'm doing a lot of media work now. So coaching around the media, I will go um, get coached by people. Um, and this is something that you have to do because I, uh, you, what you've got to remember from the age of nine up until 38, I was playing football. I was coaching. I was being coached to play football. Now I need to take the next, next step and, 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 and look at the, the, the afterlife. I mean, actually, Emil, you know, you, you, you've got kids who are, who are, you know, now about to enter the professional game and, you know, attached at clubs. Mm -hmm. Do you ever talk to them about how different their pre-season and their preparation is compared to the days that, uh, uh, how it was for us back in those days? No, not really. They, mine are very younger. Mine are under 13, under 15. So it'll be, it'll be another couple of years before they actually see a pre-season like that. But I think they understand it. But again, when they, if they ever come home uh, complaining, then I'll tell them, <laughs> well, you, uh, well, well, at least you didn't run until you were sick. And that was kind of, yeah. What our preseasons were. Yeah. Um, I was speaking to someone about it today. So um, I'm coaching at the women's. And so we're, we're back at the old training ground that I used to um, I used to train at with Leicester. And I was telling I was telling one of the guys that we used to have a multi gym and we'd do a circuit around the multi gym and then run around the whole training pitch and come and do another circuit and then run around the whole training pitch. And it was and, and this is in the snow. So. It's, it, but it's totally different now. So we, we're getting more science-led and more specific. But again, one of the themes that comes across in the book, and, and, and particular when you, you were playing for people like um, Martin, um, you know, there is this thing where you, put, you, you showed the importance of putting the hard yards in. Mm -hmm. um, and there was a mentality there that I think is lacking today. Uh, but it seemed to feel very natural for you. And you, you seem, you said you actually like training. Yeah, yeah I love training. But again, I, that, that was built into me by my parents as well. So I had to go for runs. We, <laughs> we used to have a high, high rise, um, I think about 17 floors. And my dad knew the people in the, in the block of flats. So he'd bring the and we'd have to run up the stairs twice, come back down. 
and they run up all the stairs and you have to, you're not allowed to hold on and you've got to touch every step. So they're the sort of things that we do. We do hill runs and I'm talking at the age of, I'm talking at the age of 13, 14. Wow. So yeah, we did, we did, we did a lot of tough things. So once I'd got through a lot of that, I knew that really I can get through anything because, because again, when I got to my first preseason, I kid you not, I thought I was going to die. <laughs> I was at the back of all the running, but by the time, because I was mentally strong and I knew where I wanted to get to and how to get there, by the end of the preseason, I was at the front. I was pushing everyone. Oh, that's great. But I, I, it meant I'd, I'd push myself to the point where I wouldn't, I didn't want to lose in any of the running, even though I'm, I was a 14 stone, six foot two lad. Hi, good evening, everyone. Thanks to Jason and obviously thanks to Emil. I'm a, a, a yearning father. So um, my son's tuning in tonight listening, so thank you. Um, my, my question was about your physique. You were so fast as a sprinter. And I was, and my question is linked to what you were just talking about. How did you, how did you deal with that, the endurance drills? Do you know what I'm saying? Because you could dust five yards, you're gone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. The, the, um, they, um, they were the toughest ones. They were the toughest yeah. ones. But again, I, 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 just see, I just saw it as mental. Because Same. I never got, I never, it wasn't, I wasn't there first. I wasn't there right at the beginning. But I knew once I worked my way up, as in time-wise, so pre-season, eight weeks. By the eighth week, I knew I would be either just behind you or just in front of you. <laughs> so I'd all, I, worked my, I worked my way uh, mentally that way, I, to the point where we had one guy, who his name was Lee Philpot, and he was the best runner at the club. And I was, I think I was 16 at the time. I just, I just pulled up my hamstring. So I was coming back from my hamstring injury. And uh, everyone's telling you, yeah, he's a good runner, blah, blah, blah. And every club's got a, uh, a canal run. And the canal run is about 20 minutes, 18 to 20 minutes long. So the, the physio goes, you two, go on, do that canal run. So we went down, went to the canal, and then we set off. But in my head, I've told myself already, he's not beating me. I'm sticking with him. I need to take him off. And he's just going, he's going, he's going. I kid you not, I thought I was going to die then. I, but I told myself I can't stop. I can't stop. And then this, then the other demon on my side is saying, "You've got to stop. You're going to pull something. You're going to pull something." And then I'm telling myself, "No, nah, I can't stop. He can't beat me." And I carried on, carried on. And then he pulled up. He started to feel his hamstring, and I thought, "Oh, thank you." <laughs> <laughs> but I, I swear, I was ready to pull something by not letting him beat me. Okay. Otis has got a big smile on his face, by the way, uh, Emil. <laughs> Fantastic. Uh, Cheatham. Um, just drawing on some of the, the background that you give in the book to your upbringing, your family, your cultural background, how much of a part do you think that history and that heritage played in that mental resilience that you then showed over the years? Huge, because again, when you, when you look at it, what my parents had to endure and what they've instilled in me help me just move forward and not take things too personally um, even though it was very personal and, and, and wasn't nice um, it allowed me to just brush it off and go again brush it off and go again and when you show that resilience and you're good they allow that you're you you've got your foot halfway through the door then um, I'll give you an example my friend my best friend he endured a lot more than I did during our youth team, um, uh, during our two, two years at youth team. And that was, I think, because I was f a further ahead and they couldn't get rid of me, but he was kind of disposable, um, which sounds bad, but that was, that was kind of it. And he's from a Jamaican background, I'm from an Antiguan background, but it's still Caribbean. And we, just, we were just different, we weren't, when I look at certain people and, and they look at the, like black people and they say, and they, they have a stereotype on them, we're just different. I'm not only, uh, yes, I might be loud, but I'm not aggressive, I'm not this, I'm not that. If you get to know us, you'd just be like, yeah, whatever. Mm. But you, a lot of the time it is, it, they don't and they're, they're going off some, uh, a, a narrative that has been fed to them by someone else. Mm. And then that pulls you back unless you're very good within football. And then they'll go, oh, all right, he can go past. And that was kind of where I was. Um, we've got a question from Sean Gallagher, Gallagher and it's, uh, do you believe you've got the true recognition 
you deserve for everything you achieved in your career. And he also goes on to say, and how did you deal with the relentless media tabloids, um, especially when playing for Liverpool and England? So there's there's two biggies there, Emil. Yeah. Uh, do I believe I, I got the recognition from um, from my players and my fans? Media, no, because again, they have a, it's kind of a, not a vendetta, but some sort of agenda to get certain players through and others. If it doesn't fit what they think it should be, then it's, you know, that we don't want it anywhere near it. So, um, yeah, I, th I think I did get the, I did get the recognition. Um, how, what was the one, one? How did I deal with it? Yeah, yeah. Uh, how, did after, how did you deal with the relentless media tabloids, especially when playing? You know, you, you, you've got to, you've got to, you've got to form very thick skin when you're in that arena. Anything you do, and you're in the public eye, you've got to form very thick skin. Even more so now because of social media. But I think back then it was it was relentless. It was it was horrible. It was it was bullying to be honest with you. Some parts of it. Um, I remember, I remember um, we went to the 2010 World Cup and come back and <laughs> Ledley King and Ashley Cole were coming off the plane and I don't know, they, they were talking and smiling or whatever. And he said, look at these two uh, smiling, Emil Heskey and, and uh, Ashley Cole. And I thought, well, Ledley, I, I, I still can't grow a beard or a moustache and they're, they're, they're calling me uh, him. They're, they're, they're mistaking me for him. Um, but I just thought it was just so programmed in their head that to who to attack that they didn't even notice that they were attacking the wrong person. Um, my question was, let me, um, it, I said, do you think football would be different if there was more ethnic coaches or managers? I think it would be. Uh, um, I, I think it would be a lot easier for the for the and a lot more simple for the the black players coming through. Because again, I can recognise when certain people, are, what certain people are going through, and, and 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 others can't, because I've been through it and I know it, and I know people around my area that, that are going through that same thing. So I can recognise certain things, but then um, others can't. So I, I, so having someone who of a, of different backgrounds in the in the actual training facility in the training facility can help, because as well. Um, I, I always say to the coaches that my son won't come, come to you and say anything to you if, if anything happens in this manner or that man. My son won't, he won't. And they don't, and, and some people don't get it. They just think I'm attacking them, I'm picking on No, I'm not picking on you, I'm attacking you. I'm just saying he won't come to you. Um, there's cultural differences that, that stand out as well. Now, if, um, if you're being told off by your elder as a black person, you don't look them in their eye. You don't look them in their face. You look if the you look if they box you down, but if you don't look at your coach in their face, they will say they will take it as disrespect, and they will they, that then you've got you to have a problem. But the coach doesn't know that you're actually showing him the utmost respect by not looking at him in his face. So there's little cultural differences that some people don't get, and they get passed over by saying, "Oh, he's got an attitude problem. He's got this. He's got that." And there's no one there to actually tell him, "No, well, no, he's actually showing you the most respect to you." It's a great question, um, um, Nadir, great question. Now, now, folks, this is the book. If you haven't got it, go and get it, please. Um, it's a fantastic read and, and he lets us inside. And, it, and it's a great lead on to Matt Blake makes an observation or asks a question. And I think when you read this book, you might uh, find the answer. But Emil, I'm going to ask it to you anyway. He says, do you think your mentality beats your ability? I think it came hand in hand. Um, my mentality was very high. And my, and my, a lot of people think I just came onto the scene and as this 17. No, I, 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 I was topping everything. And then I actually got the chance to go to um, go to trial for the England schools. So you actually go away for two years from 14 to 16. You go and, you go and stay in Lillyshaw um, and play all the England. You play for England schools. I got the chance to do that. But my mum said, no, you got, you're not going anywhere. So, but I was still in and around the England camp. So from the age of 15, 16, all the way up. So I, I had the ability there and ability shone out above everything, but the mentality had to be strong in the, in the era that I was coming through and being a big, strong black guy 
but I could actually play as well. I wasn't just a let me hold the ball and let me do this. No, I could play. I could run. I could go take you on if I wanted to. I could run. I could play left wing and and and, and, and drop the shoulder and, and take you down the side and, and whip across you. But I didn't need to show that because again, I played the role within the within the team that I was playing. We've got a hand up from Yusuf. Yusuf, would you like to unmute and ask a question? Uh, hi. Um, I got a question. Um, how is your relationship between Michael Owen on and off the pitch? On the pitch, it was wonderful. Um, it's obviously we, me and Michael played together from under 18s England. So we just, you know, when you just click with someone and they understand yeah. you, you understand them. You just got this telepathy, and it, it worked. Uh, but off the pitch, we didn't really have a relationship, to be honest with you, at all. Not at all. Uh, but just something that just clicked on the pitch and we, you look at it, we knew exactly where each other wanted to be. We knew exactly where each other was going. So it just worked so well. But yeah, off the pitch, I didn't really have a relationship. I do I do media with him now and again, now, but even though, no, I don't really have much of a relationship with him. And um, who's the difficult, um, the most difficult defender you, had, you got up against? Um, do you know what? Sol Campbell was tough. Sol Campbell was tough. Um, he was big, he was quick, he was strong, he could win headers. So coming up against me, it was more or less the same. So we kind of cancelled each other out. But it was, you know, when it's a, just a good, a good battle that you enjoy. Yeah. Even though you come off with a lot of bruises. Mm. Was it when he played for Spurs or Arsenal? Both. Oh, I, can't, I can't discriminate. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. No worries. Okay, Jadam, uh, carry on. Let's field some more questions. We've got we've got a few uh, questions around your time at Liverpool. Some people mm -hmm. are curious about how, I guess, what was the difference between being at different clubs? Was there a massive difference in philosophy and therefore training and regimes and stuff like that? Um, philosophy, obviously, you have ball retention at Liverpool. You um, have gone from um, playing more percentage-wise where you're hitting channels and you've got to try and win the ball and, and keep it up in there and, and uh, just cause a bit of havoc and win throw-ins, win corners, etc. Um, to having 60-70% of the possession and, and having to build up, having to uh, uh, create spaces to break lines, get, um, get in between lines to, to get on the ball and turn and then drive up. So it was totally different philosophies. Um, and then as well, I went from um, we'd come up we'd come up from the what 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 was League One at the time, um, which is Championship now, to the Premier League. So we expected there's no expectancy with us really. We were a yo-yo team anyway. So um, you know it, there wasn't really really that that sort of pressure um, to go and do anything, win anything, and then going to a club where you have to win every game and you've got to be challenging for the uh, for the Premier League and you've got to be challenging for Europa League and you've got to be challenging for every single cup that you go into so it was just that mentality that it was just relentless every single game you've got to be on par with the with with the last one if not better um, so yeah that was tough because I like I said I hadn't had that mentality where yes you want to win every game but there's it's not it's not you're expected to win every game at, at, at Liverpool if you don't win a game, if you draw a game, that's the problem. I can see a question from Peter Robinson. He's asking, who was your best captain? And he's put at LFC. Well, that could be Leicester, but I'm guessing he means Liverpool. Liverpool, um, yeah. and, and why? I think, to be honest, there was two. I'll say, I'll, I'm going to give you the first one. I'm going to give um, Gary Mack. Gary Mack came in as a, as a, as a senior pro. And we were young. I was 22. I think Stevie was 19. I think Michael was 20. Um, and then you had John Honoris, people black came in a bit later. But I think, I think uh, Gary Mack just settled everything down. And when you needed that senior player to really just calm everything, he was there. When you had that senior player to speak to, he was that guy. So I think he was that he was one of the main ones. And then Stevie came in a bit later. Who was just a driving force from midfield? Who's just a wonderful player? Who, who, who? His mentality was um, to be the best and to drive the best and make you the best as well, and keep putting pressure on you because he knows what. It, and and the thing is, 
I think a lot of players nowadays, they get upset when people are having a go at them. They're only having a go at them because they know what you can actually do and they need that every single time. They can't afford for you to, to, to drop that standard. So they're only really having a go at you to pick your standard back up to where they believe you are. And that was what he was like. No, I need this from you. I, I know you can do this. I need that from you. I, but then he led by example as well. So he would be that leader to do that as well. Now I can see we've got uh, Pancho who wants to ask a question. Yeah. Um, how, how, did you, how did you deal with doubt from yourself and other people around you? Um, the thing for me, I was mentally very strong. So I tried not to, I tried not to let any, any one's view of me sway how I feel of myself. So I would always have a positive view of myself. I would go out there and train. I train hard. I know I love training. I love training because again, that's, that's just role playing for, for when you get on that pitch. So I would do all the good stuff on training and then take it onto the pitch. And I, again, that's when people are saying negative of things about that's their problem don't let it seep into you because you know you're there for a reason thank you thank you emil you're six foot two is that correct yeah six one and a half oh right. say six two bro. <laughs> oh, right. how many goals did you score in your professional career uh good question over 100 uh i think it's 100 120 130 uh how many goals did you score for england seven and how many england caps did you get 62 62. Because uh, Emil, the, con the conundrum is for, for me, understanding you. I remember when you was at um, Leicester and you first broke out. And you was mm. right. You was, uh, you was more like a, you was like a winger. You was, I saw you like mm -hmm. say, drop your shoulder. And then um, when you was at Liverpool, there was that big thing about you being more aggressive in the box and, and being more dominated. And put, be more dominating. Um, you was a number nine. Is that correct? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I used well, I played. I played. I played. I played on the wing as well. Yeah. Well. Yeah. There was. There, there was that one game. I think it was a uh, against Milan. I think, and you tore them to pieces up front. You ripped them to pieces as a striker. Your 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 role as a striker was absolutely incredible. So it's it's almost like you're forgot. You're the forgotten man. Do you, do you get what I'm trying to say to you? Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, the thing is, when when you when you when you're looking, at, yeah. Look, I think he, what he's trying to say is like, um, I I I wasn't appreciated for what I was doing, but again, appreciated by who? Now uh, I was appreciated, but when when you're saying um, when you ask Michael who's his favourite um, player to play with, they will say he will say probably me. I think Wayne Rooney might might consider me as well. I, I set up Wayne Rooney's first England goal. Um, Defoe, play, players like that would have loved to have played with me when they were when they were younger. Um, so I wasn't necessarily about myself. I was more about the team, and that was probably what got me the longevity. Because when you when you look at goal scores, if they're not going to score your goals, what else are they going to give you? I mean, inevitably, it, it, it's nothing. They don't really give you anything else other than the goals. But when you're looking at a full package. You want to mix the whole thing together and get as many goals as you do assist, as you do as creating and, and, and winning headers and doing all this. And that's what I was about. Um, I played a lot of games left wing, right wing, because that's where the manager wanted me to play. I know forwards that will say, nah, I ain't playing there. But I, I, wasn't, that, I wasn't that guy. I just, I just went and played there. Just before we go to Gary's question, is that why, tongue in cheek, the book was called Even Heskey Scored? Yeah, look, I think I think it's about um, taking that back, isn't it? Um, mm. I know the fans, the fans sang it. I just thought, yeah, why not? Why not take that back? Um, not many people can say they've played in two World Cups, scored over 100 Premier League goals, two Euros, won the Super, won the Super Cup. Go on, my boy. Scored in the Super Cup final, won UEFA Cup, won four League Cups, played in six finals, won the FA Cup. So um, th this is the thing. Everyone can everyone can have poke fun at anyone who they want, but at least be at least do something as well. Yeah, constructive. Okay, Gary. Evening, Emil, and evening Hi. to a lot of friends in the audience. Um, How are you doing? Yeah, good. Thanks. Just it's just a question in my job role. I do deal with some ex players, um, mm -hmm. and you know, it's a question really that a lot of players 
current players struggle with that transition of finishing their mm-hmm. career. And the irony is, you touched on it earlier, Jason Roberts obviously was thinking about the end of his career while he was playing, and, and he's gone on to do very well. What was your experience like when you were coming to the end of your career? And who do you think's responsible for support players in this area? Because, I mean, there's a lot of mental health issues, gambling, addictions. I'd be keen to know your view on all that. Oh, big question. Uh, who do I think is responsible? So for my career, I wasn't ready. I was ready to retire, but I wasn't ready for the next bit because I hadn't planned. Um, the, the MIP that Jason went on, I think he was on MIP two or was he one? Anyway, the MIP that Jason was on, I was supposed to be on as well. But the daunting part was I was 38 at the time. No, 39 at the time. And the daunting thing was I left school at 16. Do I really want to go into classroom at 39? Mm. And I just couldn't get that out of my head. And it took till I was 42 and Jason and Stillian and all these people telling me, no, you've got to go and do it. It's amazing. You've got to go and do it. You've got to go and do it. You'll be fine. We'll help you. We'll get you through it, blah, blah. I needed that reassurance because, again, and this is where I'll talk about, I touch on the education side of things. If, if people are doing it during a career, they don't worry about it. They don't just go and do it because it, it's not out of their comfort zone. It's normal for them. But that was out of my comfort zone. When I leave school at 16 and don't sit back in the classroom and don't do anything to do with class or, or education again, and then to go back at 42. Uh, wow, crazy. Um, who do I think is responsible? I think the PFA do a fair bit, but the PFA, you have to be um, uh, open enough and proactive enough to go to them. But as we know with footballers, they're the last people that they're going to go to. Um, footballers will rather they rather just stay at home and, and not say anything and their mind just go crazy before they actually pull out, reach out to someone and it won't be the PFA. So I think the PFA need to be a bit more proactive in the years where, where you, if, even if they're saying every 20, uh, when they get to 29, this is what we're going to do for them. We're going to have to keep keep badgering them, keep going to them. They have enough, they have enough ex-players they can actually hire to just go and be in a certain area and say, no, nah, I'm going to go and see him today. I'm going to go and see him. I'm just going to badger him about what he's doing. What has he got planned? What, what, what are his plans? Has he got education? Can he go and do um, a master's? They've got a master's in, in Manchester uh, for, for um, a directorship. Can he go and do that and be a director on a board somewhere? Because again, we've got so much to give back to football. You've seen so many things going wrong with football. <laughs> uh, the, the, that offside the other day. Um, the Man City one. Yeah. Anyone could have told you that that was just stupid and 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 so it was just waiting to happen. So little things like that uh, that we all have, or we all should be giving back to, but we don't get the opportunity to. Don't you think agents have a, a responsibility as well? No, oh, that's not their role. Yeah, but that's should it problem. be? Well, it's not their problem. They're they're an agent to to get you a move. And this is where we put so much, you, got, you put so much emphasis on this agent. The agent does, he does little to nothing. The way, he comes alive when you actually make the move. So let's let, just let him do that then. And let's have other people doing the other parts of it. No. Um, because again, I, I, you know, we could have an agent doing the marketing. You could have an agent doing your, your, um, your finance. You could have an agent doing your, um, all, all your endorsements and all this, and then your business and all that. And then when, by the end of it, you're looking at, well, what has he actually done? Well, he's, he's a master in nothing apart from the agent bit. Well, do that and let me go and get a marketer, a guy who does the marketing for me. Let me go and get another guy, another person, another lady who does the uh, um, the finance for me. Let's go and get a, a, a lady who does, um, I don't know, something else for me. So I think it's, I think you've got to get it more specific because um, you've got, you'll get nothing done. Okay. Thanks, Gary. Thanks. Listen, we're going to go to Abdi Rahman. Can you take your mic off? Um, there's a couple of hands up, and then Cheedon, we're coming to you for some of the questions in the uh, chat box. So, Abdi, please. Hi, Hesky. How are you doing? Uh, I have a question. I was going to ask which club did you enjoy playing at the most, and why? I loved Liverpool. Absolutely loved Liverpool. Um, supported Liverpool as a kid. And loved every minute of it, being it, um, winning trophies. And that's what you go to. I, I grew up going, look, watching these players play, watching John Barnes play and 
wanting to emulate him and wanting to win trophies. So love that it be having the chance to win trophies. So, but again, playing for my hometown team is was great as well. So having my parents there every weekend, just just a stone throw away. Um, able to come to cup finals w- with Leicester as well. I was lucky enough to have my nan come and watch me um, watch me play in the cup final before she passed away. So yeah, it was um, them, them them experiences were wonderful. Zakaria, can you un- unmute yourself, please? Um, what was your favourite season and why? 2000-2001 was my favourite season. Um, scored 22 goals and uh, won five trophies. I think it was five. Mm. I don't know. The thing is, I don't even know if I can count it as five. So we won, obviously we won three. We won the treble. We won um, League Cup, FA Cup and UEFA Cup. And then the following pre-season, so in the June, we won uh, Super Cup. In the so it was five five cups within about a three month period. <laughs> yes, five. <laughs> so yeah, it was um, that was the season, and everything just went well. Everything clicked for the team. Everything ticked for myself, and we just we were just on a massive massive high. So yeah, it was great, and it was my first full season at Liverpool. Thanks, Zachariah. Uh, Can we have Jay Coots, please? All right, so basically, Hesky, um, what I was going to say to you is, what would you say um, you do to motivate yourself during that corona and stuff to keep yourself fit and everything? I'm lucky because I'm coaching right now with um, yeah. with Less City Women's. So I'm, mm. in, I'm in a bubble. So I'm allowed to yeah. go to training. I'm allowed to coach, etc. So with that, um, when we had the full lockdown... I was going for walks and going for runs um, because it's easy to put on weight. Um, So I was going for runs, being really strict on my food intake and going for walks, which which just gives you that little bit of fresh air and and sometimes can clear your mind at times. Okay. Um, Who would you say is your inspiration? Um, Good question. I would say my parents, my dad. He was a he was a cricketer. Um, I didn't see him play football, but okay. they said he was he was a decent footballer. But I used to go to watch him play cricket all the time. So I wanted to I wanted to be good at something. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Right, we're okay, going you. we're going to Otis next. Uh, Otis, hi right, Mill. All right, mate. Um, just a quick question from me. Um, a, a lot's been made about over the years young players going abroad and, you know, you watch Sancho and, you know, a few of the young English players are going on loan now. I know you made the move yourself towards the back end of your career to, uh, career to Australia. Tell us a little bit about how that came about and how you enjoyed it. Loved every minute of it. Um, it the funny thing is, I grew up in an era where Italian football was huge and I always said, I want to play, I want to play abroad, I want to play in Italy, blah, blah, blah. Um, I went, for I'll give you a funny story, I went, to from Liverpool, um, I was speaking to AC Milan, and I was on the call to the directors, blah blah blah, and I put everything was front happening, and I ended up in playing. I ended up playing for Birmingham, which is <laughs> which is not a bad thing, but I just thought I was going to go to. I was thought I was going to AC Milan and all this, but I thought yeah, and then obviously a bit later on in life, I got the opportunity through Robbie Fowler of all people. Um, Robbie went there and played for Queensland Fury, I think it was called. And the cent- the right back that played with him was now the director of football at Newcastle Jets. And he asked if I'd be interested in going over because my son and Robbie's son were playing football together at, at Liverpool at the time. So um, I said, you look, just tell them to send me an offer and let's have a look at it. So I had a look at it. Said Del Piero was coming, said Shinji Ono was coming, he's going to marquee players, blah, blah, blah. I thought, yeah. He said, it's great. Lifestyle's great, blah, blah, blah. I said, okay, let me try it. And it was it was really good. Um, it was it was good football, but again, I think they overdo it at times. So they want to play like a the total football, like in, like they, 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 they call it D- Dutch philosophy. But if you haven't got the players to play that at times, I think you've just got to play what you've got. So we were having... 
balls trying to play play out from the back and the, the forwards were nicking it and they were just it was like literally taking one touch and shooting and they're scoring a the goal. I say, well, yeah, it looks great, but it looks really bad when you do it that way. So let's maybe, but again, this is the way they wanted to do it. And I I got a lot of joy out of some of the younger lads asking me questions and wanting to be wanting to be coached by me and doing little things with me. So yeah, I, I, I love that side of it. And I had two two good years there.